FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Uh, with all the noise in the markets, metals up, down, we need to get uh, somebody who's got a good handle on the technicals since the long term, we all know where it's heading anyway. That's why we've got Rick Ackerman with us now of rickackerman.com. And welcome back, Rick. Morning, Kerry. Hey, so there's so much going on right now in the geopolitical scene, and yet the, uh, the markets themselves seem relatively oblivious to it, don't they? Yeah, oblivious would be the word. You know, at, at the worst uh, a heat of the Ukraine so-called crisis, Wall Street basically seemed to be saying, come on, get this over with so we can do what we do best, which was uh, go higher and higher and higher. Yeah, like, uh, let us, uh, you're interfering with our high-frequency trading, you know. Would you just get out of the way here? We have important things to do, right? Exactly. Don't, don't get me started on high-frequency trading either. <laughs> so you you think you've been a victim of uh, high frequency trading, Rick? I was on the uh, Pacific Exchange floor as a market maker for uh, about a dozen years, and I have to say that I never saw a trade come in there that was being front run by a firm. And uh, high frequency trading is just another way to do that, a high tech way and very efficient way. Yeah, and I'm reading the book now. I'm about halfway through. Uh, Flash Boys, and it's just remarkable that that nanoseconds or actually microseconds, millionths of a second, can give these guys the advantage. And all the banks were in on it; they all knew it was going what was going on. And then they start their own deep pool, ostensibly to protect their clients. And then they give the uh, flash traders the high frequency traders access to their dark pools to pick off those orders and uh, to allow their own clients to get taken advantage of and to get exploited. And we're talking billions of dollars here, Rick. Billions. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. You know, you'd think that the way we're regulated to death, that would apply in the stock market. But the way it works out is that the regulations apply only when it's a professional ripping off a retail customer. But uh, when the pros are ripping off each other, Normal rules don't apply. And uh, the funny thing is about all these denials that high-speed trading is anything bad, they essentially focus on the point that uh, high-frequency trading adds liquidity to the markets. But the joke of it is that uh, high-frequency trading accounts for more than half the volume. So that's sort of a funny argument to make. Yeah, it basically doubles the number of trades because once they find out that you're looking for, say, 100,000 shares of Microsoft, the first thing they do is they sell, sell you like 1,000 shares to figure out what you're willing to pay, and then they go front-running all the other exchanges, buy up the shares, package them up, and sell them to you. And I've seen it happen, and even in my little trades, you know, a few thousand shares here or there, where they've been broken up into multiple chunks. And I wonder, why is this happening? How come... They can't just put together 5,000 shares of this little stock. Why has it been broken up into six trades? It doesn't make any sense. And now as I'm reading the book, it's all beginning to make sense to me. Even my little shares are getting front run, my little trades. Exactly. When I was on the Pacific floor, uh, you know, one of the sleaze balls would come in there like uh, J.P. Morgan or Goldman or Bear Stearns, and they'd want to do, they'd say, give me a quote on 5,000 of these or 5,000 of those. And whenever they were doing size, you knew that they were getting ahead of their own customer's order. If they had a customer that wanted to buy, let's say, 2 million shares of a stock, the firms used to come in and buy as many call options as they could. And in that respect, they were kind of like belled cats. They're in the trading pit. They want to do size. And you're thinking, uh, as a market maker, geez, I've seen this movie before. But the prices they want to pay seem so outrageous that you think, how can I lose? And, and as, you're, as you're writing up the ticket, you see the stock print $3 higher uh, on some sort of cross, and, and you realize you've been had. So uh, I guess in that respect, greed gets the better uh, of those who are taking the other side of the trade. 
but but nothing has changed really, and and uh, the firms really go for the sure thing, where what they're in there doing essentially anticipates something that's already on their order book. Yeah, just uh, you know, we've been saying for so long on this show and our guests that the markets are rigged, and all of them are rigged, right? It's not just this one, right? It's true. It's total. I mean, there's no there's no such thing as an honest trade anymore. And there's no such thing as a market that goes up on the strength of what you might call bullish buying, people who are uh, investors who are betting on a brighter tomorrow. That's, that's absolutely gone from the market. It's just, a big, it's just a big carnival game. Yeah, and where's the concept of allocating uh, capital and risk and all that stuff? Uh, we don't care about any of that now, do we? Well, with interest rates down near zero for the big borrowers, um, they don't really much care about how they allocate capital because it's infinitely available. So uh, that's definitely a problem. And, you know, you see that we've got such a skew into financial products that uh, the heroes of the day, the role models for young MBAs uh, are these, uh, these paper shufflers. And uh, it's, it's not a good thing. I think the country would be better off if we were actually making real stuff. But in that respect, we produce maybe Tesla, and that's about it. Yeah. Yeah, that's in, almost in spite of the system, you know? Exactly. So it's just remarkable. So in the meantime, you know, we have real th- problems that are confronting the country. And what's being done, you know, Wall Street should be dealing with them. It shouldn't be in this fantasy land, right? Yeah, we're definitely in a drift that uh, does not lead in a good direction. You know, if you look at all of the things that brought the system down or nearly took it down completely in 2008, um, we're repeating the same mistakes. You know, and and whereas we had the leveraging of uh, mortgages, subprimes, and others uh, at that time, we've got a whole different uh, game going on that creates even greater leverage. It comes through rehypothecation as a subject that's been written on at some length at Zero Hedge and and other places. But basically, you can take even a a brokerage account that's been closed for reasons of, uh, let's say, a margin call, and you can make a dozen loans downstream. You you can use that busted account as collateral for doing, uh, for essentially creating greater leverage. So I think we're in much worse shape than we were when the banking system nearly went down in 2008, 2009. Yeah, I think so. And there's really nothing out there that's uh, that's going to stop this either, is there? Not at all. And, and uh, I think, you know, we had one chance to get out of the hole. It was kind of a get-out-of-jail-free card when we used it. It was essentially uh, coming out of the, the great financial crash, um, the lowering of interest rates did accomplish one thing. It allowed mortgage borrowers to, to essentially refinance down to as low as uh, 3% or so. That freed up a lot of household cash, uh, and it definitely helped household liquidity. However, that was it. I mean, if, if you did a refi at that time, you know how difficult it was to qualify, especially if you're self-employed. So uh, the rules have changed. The interest rates are still low. But qualified buyers are difficult to find, at least those that haven't done a refi yet. So in that respect, housing is now fully leveraged, and we cannot uh, essentially manufacture, engineer another housing recovery. The next time, I think we're going to go down for the count, and uh, I think we're only halfway to a bottom as far as housing prices go. Yeah, which is pretty scary because the majority of the public, due to all the propaganda that's out there, believes that happy days are here again and the problems have been solved, right? I wonder if that's true. You know, you read the cheerleading headlines in the Wall Street Journal, and I'm speaking about the news pages, not the editorial page, which is halfway sane, but I don't think anybody's fooled. You know, we've got uh, a situation where people in in their real lives, in their businesses, uh, in anecdotes they share with their friends, uh, at least the ones I share with my friends, they're struggling. I mean, it's uh, everybody's working as hard as they can just to stay afloat. And we, but we read in the papers about uh, you know Goldfine uh, getting uh, a twenty-three million dollar paycheck for last year, and things are great in the banking business, but they're 
they're difficult everywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I definitely think that's true. And yeah, you definitely are seeing that the whole statistical overlay that the administration that, that you get from the financial papers is definitely just one big fraud, right? I mean, that the underlying the real economy, regardless what the stock market's doing, is really suffering and has really been contracting since 2008. And it's completely transparent. So you don't even have to understand economics to, to see what's going on. Um, you know, I always tell my subscribers the best way to understand deflation uh, is to reckon it in terms of uh, the burden of real real debt and or, or the real burden of debt, which is to say the burden uh, unalleviated by inflation. So Europe is really skirting deflation right now, and you've had a very aggressive pronouncement from uh, Draghi that Europe will do whatever it takes to avoid a deflation, but uh, you can pretty much see that the handwriting's on a the wall. There's no avoiding it. They're already in the maw of deflation. Yeah, and what is that? What is that European deflation going to mean, Rick? Well, it's going to mean that uh, for one, that all these bozos who are are pricing up debt paper from Italy and Spain are going to be on the wrong side of the, the trade. Uh, you know, in, in a way, it's being uh, priced to suggest that the investors think Italy and Spain are great guns. But the fact is that in the uh, 20 to 35 demographic, Spain's unemployment rate is above 30 percent. So, uh, you know, Europe is dying. And I think the whole statist model there, the fatted calf, uh, that's all about to end. And uh, you just, uh, not that you can't see it, job security is a big issue there, simply because uh, other perks that come with jobs, like higher pay and things like that, uh, just aren't available. So I think... Um, you know, the, the inflation, def, the hyperinflation deflation argument has been kind of resolved in, in Europe. You can see that deflation is the clear winner here. And uh, I think that'll be the case for the USA as well. So eventually it's deflation. And yeah, we're going to talk more about that as well as where the stock market, the gold market, and the crude markets are heading on the Financial Survival Network. FSN Radio. Are you worried about protecting your wealth against a dollar collapse? Worried about gold confiscation? Owings Metals provides wearable wealth solutions that will keep your wealth safe from a declining dollar and from a government that's getting more desperate by the day. The Indians have understood this for thousands of years. Americans are just starting to catch on. When you wear an Owings Metals 24 karat piece of jewelry, you can safely cross borders and take your wealth with you. Best of all, it's insurable and unlike a lot of Indian jewelry, it's very durable. It can easily be disassembled and sold off in pieces if you need cash. It's surprisingly affordable and definitely should have a place in your wealth diversification strategy. Precious metals are like so many other types of insurance. You only find out how important and essential they are after disaster strikes. Call Owings Metals now at 855-604-6343. 855-604-6343. Don't wait until it's too late. 855-604-6343. Four three now. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. And we are back on the Financial Survival Network with Rick Ackerman. So, Rick, uh, getting a little more specific, the stock market. What's going on there? Is it going to keep heading higher? Has it hit its limit? And now we're going to see a crash there, a flash crash, even that it doesn't recover from in one day. What's your thought? Well, it's interesting. You know, the um, NASDAQ stocks, uh, mostly the momentum stocks, have led this market down. And it seems like a no-brainer that the guys, so many uh, money runners, make their living from stocks like Google and Priceline, uh, the high flyers. So it stands to reason that they would want to bring a stock like Priceline down to a nice round $1,000 so they can start buying it again. So in that respect, the pretty serious decline in the uh, NASDAQ this year would seem to be uh, just a, a manipulation to uh, deflate these stocks that, so that they become bargains again. And uh, so I've been looking for the NASDAQ stocks to turn around, but uh, I have to say it's getting a little scary here because, uh, you know, no sooner do they rally for a couple of days, we've got price line down 
uh, nearly 50 bucks today, $44. And uh, I'm starting to wonder, you know, they, they're basically tugging the uh, broad averages down now pretty hard. And we've got the Dow off uh, currently 127 points. I still think there's going to be one last run-up. If you look at uh, the uh, chart uh, going back a few months for the industrial average, it doesn't look like a topping pattern to me. You know, I, you should think that the five-year bull market, as spectacular as the one we've had, uh, should um, collapse from some fabulous new height rather than from a kind of meandering up and down that we've seen for the last few months. So I don't know. I've, I've got room to the upside. I've got a target that I uh, put out quite some time ago for the Dow of 17,622. So I'm ready for that. That's about uh, 1,300 points above where we're trading now. But uh, So let's say that I think we're going to have a blow-off high, but I've still got one foot out the fire escape. <laughs> so there's got to be a blow-off, and it's just not looking like it now. So... We could just have a little back and forth here, huh? Well, I wouldn't say there there has to be a blow off. You know, I think the one thing there has to be is some situation that absolutely guts and disembowels all the bulls. I mean, it's going to have to catch us all unawares. And in that respect, I'm just uh, one more guy in the herd that could get fooled. I'm looking for uh, a run up to at least marginal new highs, essentially a bull trap. Uh, but if the market were to fall apart here, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be completely prepared for it. I mean, it'd be a little bit of a surprise to me. And I think that um, you know, from the standpoint of the market doing what it's going to do to hurt the most people and to surprise the most people, it may not need a run up to new all time highs before they pull the plug, uh, because they could pull it any time, and we'd really be up a creek. Because all of this, uh, we talked in the first segment about what a hoax the, the financial system is and the idea that we're having an economic recovery. Um, but whatever we're having, it's completely dependent on the smoke and mirrors mirage of the stock market. You know, As long as the stocks are headed higher, in the back of their minds, people are saying, well, how bad can things be if, if we've got this, uh, this, uh, the industrial average trading near all-time highs? So the upward movement of stocks is absolutely crucial to sustaining that, that mirage, that, uh, that hoax that's keeping uh, everything afloat. Right. Yeah, well, people are starting to believe in the validity of the mirage huh, rather than what's really going on. And they've been keeping it up for so long, Rick. So how long, how much longer can they do it, I guess, is really the question, right? How much well, longer? Well, that's a hard question. That's a hard question. I've been a perma bear for too long to be the best person to get an answer from. You know, I, I've been fooled too, and I thought the jig was, I thought the jig was up in 1991 when we were talking about what sums, you know, relative to the SNL, the savings and loan crisis, the bailout was on the order of, I think, four or five hundred billion dollars. That's just small change now. And uh, at the time, I didn't have the imagination to see that we were going to take the the illusion to, to much greater extremes. You know, uh, if anybody had told me that uh, that all the business with the savings and loans in the early '90s was just a drop in the bucket, I would have said, No, no, we this is it. This is going to take the system down. It didn't even come close. Amazing, isn't it? So what about uh, precious metals? What do you see going on there? You know, that's an area that's near and dear to our hearts. Well, you know, I'm a technician with, with kind of a short uh, horizon. And uh, as of a few hours ago, I became madly in love with gold. Uh, June <laughs> gold popped through uh, two crucial thresholds. You know, we had... We had gold kind of zigzag in the last few days, and every upthrust was failing by just a couple points to reach my bullish trigger points. But it got them both today and, and then some. And uh, based on today's action, I look at, I'm looking at uh, 1431.10 uh, on the uh, June COMEX contract. We're currently trading 1318, so we've got room here for uh, $113 rally. So I love gold here. Uh, it, it's a little bit 
challenging because every time it it looks bad, it looks bad enough that I'm thinking, geez, uh, I'm starting to doubt myself here. But uh, today's uh, move in gold has definitely revived my uh, my bullish uh, love for the stuff. And uh, you can see it's somewhat corroborated by commodity moves in, in crude. Uh, we've got May crude currently trading 103 and change, but I'm looking for 106.80 there. So we've got uh, a little bit of uh, money flowing out of fiat and into hard goods today. So so it's looking pretty good for June, huh? You've fallen in love. Yeah, I like uh, I like the looks of it, and I think there's there's really good leverage here in some of the beaten down gold stuff, particularly the uh, the gold bugs, the, the junior miners vector GDXJ is the symbol, and it's been acting pretty good, but. That's as you should expect because these uh, mining stocks have really they've had the, the, the stuffing knocked out of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, has it ever. So, And what about the longer-term outlook, even though I know you're a, more of a technical, shorter-term perspective on things? Well, I think uh, the tail will wag the dog here. You know, the jig will be up for the, the fraudulent global economy, the so-called recovery, when the market turns down with a vengeance. And uh, if, if we're going to have one last blow-off, uh, I'm looking for that 1,300-pointer on the day out to 17,622. Um, I, I, I would never count the, the manipulators out. I mean, you can see uh, even earlier this week where even if there is zero bullish buying interest, they can still get the Dow up 100 points. And, of course, it, it comes completely out of uh, short squeeze factors. And you can see that every little, if you, you get on the five-minute chart, you see that every little up thrust that, that gets through some previous highs, previous resistance, comes from stops getting run by a low that took out some prior low. So in that respect, the rallies are very technical. There's no, I don't sense that there's any real bullish buying interest. But, again, the point is you don't need it to get – take this market up 100 points, uh, the bears at this point have become so skittish after five years of bull market that they don't really want to get in the way. And, you know, when you take the market down for just two days in a row, these, the bears think this is, this is from heaven. They better cover. And, of course, they're so habituated to doing that that you can absolutely predict that there's going to come a day when the market's going to fall and it's going to fall with a vengeance and the shorts are going to cover, and they're going to cover, and they're going to cover. And by the time they've covered all of their short positions, which uh, means that their buying power will no longer be there, uh, they're going to realize that they've, they've uh, basically bought, them, bought everything back in, uh, maybe 10% into the decline. So they're going to be uh, looking at the market coming down, and they'll, they'll cover all their shorts, but the avalanche will still be to come. Yeah, and hey, one quick question. You know, because the high frequency traders, they know where the stops are for the uh, for people placing buy buy stops and sell stops, correct? And they know how to trigger these. Am I not mistaken? I have to say that as much as I believe that high frequency trading is an absolute criminal fraud, um, that it doesn't much affect the markets except in the very short term. Mm -hmm. now, these guys uh, are some, essentially picking off uh, the order book going both ways, and uh, I, I don't think high-frequency trading really uh, affects much of anything. And I do think that with respect to a flash crash, there are circuit breakers within the uh, high-frequency loop that prevent high-frequency trading per se as being a reason for an absolute market collapse. I think the collapse will come uh, not from technology, but more organically from uh, just a wave of fear sweeping the investment community. Got it. All right. So, Rick, uh, people want to sign up for your course, go to your website, sign up for your newsletter. Where do they go? RickAckerman.com. Uh, the name of the service is called Rick's Picks. If you Google that, though, you come up with the pickle and relish vendor from New York City. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, I put out daily uh, actionable uh, trades, and uh, I try to gear some of them for uh, 
uh, absolute novices. So if you've never made a nickel trading options, uh, come give me a try, and we'll see if we can get you in a good vertical spread that uh, shows you what's capable, uh, what you can do with options. So that's uh, rickackerman.com, and uh, you can take a, a free two-week trial, no credit card necessary, and that'll get you in the chat room where we've got a lot of uh, great traders from all over the world. All right. And of course, uh, just go over to financialsurvivalnetwork.com, click the link in the show notes to this interview, and you'll get to Rick's site. And Rick, uh, thanks so much for being on. It's always great. Thank you, Kerry. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. 